A man returns to live in his childhood home and finds it's not the place it used to be. He and his new tenants are terrorized by evil spirits and demonic forces. Paranormal investigators must come up with an answer before it's too late. In America, there is real evil. It lurks in the darkest shadows and in our most ordinary towns. Between the worlds we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. Mark Corvo is no ordinary child. He often sleepwalks and has a rare talent, but doesn't realize it yet, and won't until decades later. Mark is an empath able to sense the presence of spirits. He experiences vivid dreams. But are they all too real? Mark, are you down there? In 2011, Mark Corville returns to Cromwell, Connecticut as the new owner of his childhood home. In spite of his sleepwalking, which stopped as he grew older, Mark retains fond memories of his youth and family life in the 18th century house. It's a old colonial in a very nice part of town, one of a kind. Being Italian, we'd have family over, and there's always good food and good eats. It really was a lot of fun to grow up there, and everybody loved each other. It was a great place. Mark's newfound happiness is tinged with sadness. He acquired the house after his parents died, one soon after the other. Mark recognizes that for him, it will always be a special place. From when I was small, I always had the ability to sense different things that were going on. But as you grow up, you get involved, and I sort of put it on the back shelf and ignored it. Mark plans to take in tenants, but first, there's a lot of repainting to take care of. It needed a lot of cosmetic work. The house is old, and it does have a tendency to creak and moan. I thought I heard footsteps. It was startling. I thought maybe somebody was playing a joke on me. There was nobody there. I didn't know what to think, and I was tired, so I just went to bed, and that was it. Well, this is it. This will be your room. Nice. After a month of renovating, Mark welcomes his first potential tenant, Sean Angus, a local firefighter. I'm trying to restore this place to its former glory. I'll take it. I was ready to move out of my mother's house. I uh, was looking for a place to rent. I loved the location. It was right up the street from the firehouse, so I decided to move in.
Trammell's a small town, like a little village. And I knew that in a very short period of time, I'd be able to rent that side of the house out. Ashley Singer has just moved to the area. Hey, you had a room advertised? Right, I have a room for rent, correct. Would you like to see it? Yeah. yeah. Follow me. Ashley considers herself a spiritual person and senses a presence. Ashley, this way. Okay, thanks. Ashley's a very interesting and eclectic person, and I knew she would appreciate the history of the house. With two tenants now in place, Mark's never-ending restoration work continues. Need a hand? Sure, that'd be great. And volunteers are welcome. I gotta get a nail. Just a second. Set it down for a minute. That's an old well. It's been there forever. I bet. Yeah, how deep do you suppose it goes? It's deep. The well was built at the time of the house in 1741 and was long abandoned before Mark grew up here. He's rarely given it a second thought since he was a child. It's the blessing and curse of living in a 200-year-old home, the hissing of the pipes, the miscellaneous bangs. Mark isn't the only one hearing strange noises at night. Sean told me you know, there's a lot of noises and things going on, and I just attributed it to pipes. He understood and eventually got used to it. Ashley believes there could be another reason for those strange noises. She senses the house is haunted and studies the spiritual world. She would tell me that there was a lot of activity, that she had seen this or had seen that, or something else was happening. I didn't minimize it, but I didn't really give it the full credence that I probably should have. A few weeks later. And I smelled smoke. Smoke was coming from Ashley's room. Oh my God, is the house on fire?
Mark Corville moves back into the house he grew up in, where a mysterious well and vivid dreams colored his childhood. Recently, he's encountered unexplained events and strange noises. And now, one of his tenants appears to be trapped in her burning room. Ashley, are you in there? Ashley! Ashley! We gotta get out of here! It's fuck! She seemed to be in a trance in a world of her own. It's my sacred place. I banish you away. She was holding a pile of twigs, and all the smoke was coming from there. You have or hold no power here. I realized she must be performing some kind of ritual. To me, it was completely alien and strange what she was doing. Ashley! Ashley! Sorry, I was just smudging the room. What? Yeah, it's it's sage. It's for spiritual cleansing. Look, I've always been a spiritual person. Some people have even called me a white witch. A witch? There are malevolent forces in your house. She told me there are spirits in the house that need to be cleansed. Well, just be careful. Don't burn the house down. Mark, I'm sorry, I should have warned you. Despite what's happened, Mark retains a soft spot for his unusual tenant. As long as she didn't start the house on fire and paid her rent on time, what she did in the privacy of her rental apartment was fine by me. Mark, I'm taking a trip to New Orleans and I told a friend she could stay at my place while I was away. That's fine. A few days later. You must be... Sadra, Ashley's friend. Let me take that for you. Oh, thank you. This way. Alone in the house, she drifts off to sleep. Leaves the home in search of safety. But she returns one last time to confront Mark. I don't know what kind of scam you've got going. Sorry, I don't know what. Save it. I'm out of here. Tell Ash I'm not sticking around. And that was the end of Sadra. Last I saw of her. Now my antennas are up. I'm starting to get alarmed at what's going on. When you rent a house out, your uppermost thought in your mind is that everybody is safe and protected. The way she ran out of that house was just uh, very, very strange and alarming. Mark's tenant, Ashley, who claims she's a white witch, returns from her trip to New Orleans with some new friends. I could tell she seemed different. You OK? Fine. She seemed a little darker than she had been when she left. She was my tenant, and I respected her right to have guests, but I just didn't feel right about them being in the house. Ashley's friends are originally from Haiti, 
Mark has no idea that they are in the attic, practicing the witchcraft of their homeland. All right, quit it. It's time to start. They're performing a voodoo ritual to try and make contact with the spirits Ashley believes are in the house. As Ashley grows more intense, she gives Mark an ominous warning. They had blessed the house with voodoo, and if I ever sold the house, and ever left the family, I would die. Ashley. She was very nervous and easily spooked. Uh, we need you inside for the next part. I'm fine. The mysterious Haitians soon leave. But now the white witch wishes she hadn't dabbled with the spirits and is convinced they're evil and after her own soul. She was smudging the house on a daily basis. Ashley! Ashley is desperate to try to cleanse the house in any way she can, but she's convinced the spirits are growing stronger. Ashley! She told me it's just too intense. The spirits are here. Ashley spends hours alone in the house, terrorized and tormented by the evil presence. Go! It's hard to see somebody be in that kind of distress and turmoil. That's it. That's it. I can't live here anymore. Ashley, talk to me. Just no! To me. You don't understand! She just couldn't tolerate the intensity of what she perceived was coming at her from the house. She was frightened. She was truly frightened. Abruptly, Ashley disappears. She just took off and left her stuff, even. That's how adversely impacted she was by what she perceived was going on in the house. I was really upset, angry, plus concerned, I mean, was it the house? Was it that apartment? Living in a place like that, which you really love, then all of a sudden you find out, oh my God, you know, what's going on here? With Ashley gone, only Sean and his new girlfriend, Jessica, remain in the house with Mark. In a home that dates back to the 1700s in Cromwell, Connecticut, spirits are terrorizing tenants and visitors. Two have been compelled to leave. Now Jessica, the girlfriend of Sean Angus, has become the target of something menacing. I didn't know what was gonna happen to me next, what was gonna happen in that room. I was terrified. What, 
what's going on? What what the hell? There was this thing and it, it, it was coming it was okay. coming in the bed and there was this thing like a white a white sheet that was over the bed and it was well, like, You're it was dreaming. Coming. No, I wasn't. I tried to wake you and you wouldn't wake okay. up. Okay, well just okay, just come and she... Kept saying repeatedly, "I have to get out, out of here. I have to get out of here." I, no, I can't. I'm sorry. I, I can't. I'll, I'll call you. Told Sean I love you. Got in my car and didn't look back. What? Did you? The next day, I told Sean I can never stay in the house ever again. Mark is stunned when he hears of this latest night of horror. I felt angry. I felt concerned. I felt troubled. What is going on? Gonna miss you guys. Wish sure there was another way. Sean said, listen, I have Sorry. to find some place else to live. Uh, Jessica's not really comfortable here, given the experience that she had. He was quite surprised that we needed to move out, but wasn't surprised that we actually saw something. It's almost like he knew there was something in the house. Mark feels compelled to act, launching his own paranormal investigation, aided by tips and guidance from books, TV shows, and the internet. I've always been a person of action. I didn't want to have new tenants come in if there was going to be some situation. I developed a plan based on EVPs or electronic voice phenomena. Who are you? Who are you? When I say away, away. I came upon what looked like a place of sacrifice or a, a very ritualistic altar with a dead bird, carcass, cross, and an empty bottle. If this was voodoo, I mean, what was my house turned into? Day and night, Mark wanders his home in the hope of making contact with the spirits that have brought so much misery and fear. Who are you? Why are you here? What do you want? That, for me, was the moment where I realized that my house was haunted. What do you want? I knew that I was in serious trouble. For more A Haunting, go to DestinationAmerica.com. After months of terrifying paranormal encounters, who are you? Why are you here? Mark Corvo has managed to capture EVP recordings of the voices of spirits in his 270 year old home. But now, an evil presence has made itself known and issued a direct threat to his life. I knew now I needed some help, professional help. Mark contacts Goners, the ghosts of New England Research Society. Goners, this is Kurt Knapp. Kurt is a former police officer who's been a paranormal investigator for more than two decades. When Mark Corville first called me, he sounded 
kind of stressed out about the situation he was facing. Well, how long have you been living in the house? Gorner's primary mission is to determine, first of all, if a haunting is genuine, and if it is, to determine how we can best help the people in the house. Thank you, Mr. Corbo. Let me get you a cup of coffee here first. Yeah, that sounds good. So, Mark, what's been going on in the house? Well, I'll tell you, I had a couple of tenants. They had to move out from everything that's been going on, all the noises. The, poor Ashley, she ran out of here screaming. They found in police work that Just after so an hour or so, a person will start to change their story if they're lying to you. Well, there was none of that with Mark. He was as genuine in the end as he was in the beginning. Now I'm starting to hear a few things myself. I did some preliminary research on the property. I got a few things I want to show you. We found out that the house was built in 1741 by a sea captain who was active in the slave trade in the West Indies. And we do know for a fact that he kept slaves on the property. That might be the reason I've captured so many uh, EVPs. You have EVPs? Yeah, I've got some recordings. I'd love to hear them. I was able to identify about six separate voices in the EVPs he played for me. And I knew immediately that we had to investigate this property. Where did you record these? Throughout the house. It put an end to any speculation on my part that I was either seeing things or hearing things. I was kind of concerned about him, too. Kurt Knapp and his paranormal investigation team arrive, armed with an array of high-tech ghost hunting equipment. Patrick, there's a lot of EVP activity around here, so make sure the recorders are set to go, please. On the investigation, I decided to bring Karen Hollis, our resident psychic. I was immediately struck by how heavy the energy was in the home. Melanie, who is in charge of evidence evaluation. And also Pat Murphy, who acts as case manager. During an EVP session, we put people on all floors of the house, because as you're asking questions, you may get a response on another floor. Every investigation is different. As you're walking either upstairs or downstairs, you're thinking to yourself, what am I going to find? What's going to be there? What's in the darkness? Say your name. And I could feel that the energy was coalescing around that one area. And as I stepped closer to it, I realized this is more than just a well. It was deep and dark and foreboding. I think I see something. What? I'm not sure. Oh, something hit me in the chest. This dark energy, and it was overwhelming. I got the sense that there was a young child that wanted to tell its story. I felt her slip into my body. And I felt her touch my hair to see if it was her hair or mine. And then, with the sweetness of a child, she touched my cheek. I could feel her as trying to fill out 
my hands and my body and having a sense of wonder. And then her voice came out. I'm Becky. Where's Mama? Mama got sick. I took her away. The young slave girl's mother had been taken away to a doctor and never returned. She just was very desperate to know where her sick mother had gone. She's gone. I was channeling her grief over her mom. Imagine waiting centuries and never knowing if she'd return. What a horrible thing for a child to have to do. This well, this is no ordinary well. This is a portal. A portal is a door, a dimensional door. I could sense that this portal was where many spirits were coming and going both good and bad. Is someone here? Meanwhile, Kurt and Patrick, unaware of what's happening in the cellar, are three stories above exploring the attic. Yeah, these are voodoo symbols. Are you all right? I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I feel weird. It's just something that we don't see very often. It felt evil. It, it didn't feel right. Kurt. Kurt. What? Kurt. Patrick, you're freaking me out. No. Oh. A nearly 300-year-old house in Cromwell, Connecticut, has become a place of terror. A paranormal investigation team that includes a medium is starting to encounter a range of spirits. In the attic, case manager Pat Murphy believes lead investigator Kurt Knapp is in imminent danger. Kurt, Kurt. What? When I saw Pat's face, you know, he's more of a tech guy than a spiritual guy. So for him to be alarmed about something is really unusual. Oh. Oh. It was scary. My heart was racing. We finally realized that there's something very evil here, very dark. Back at the office, the paranormal investigators review their findings. They believe the house has sheltered lost souls for centuries. But when Ashley and her friends used voodoo to contact the spirits, they unleashed dark forces which rose up through the old well. I believe that whatever activity Ashley was engaged in in the house, whatever dark magic she was practicing, whatever she was trying to stir up, she was successful in that she opened a portal into another world that was bringing through not only human spirits, but also dark spirits. If there was any place that seemed like it went straight to hell, it would have been that well. Kurt and Karen arrive to present their findings to Mark, but they also have news that will change his life forever. Haven't you ever wondered why you were able to record so many voices from the afterlife? I've seen it on my own team, where two people in a room, one will get an EVP on the recorder and one won't. And I think it has more to do with the person's ability to tune in to the paranormal, to the supernatural, than anything else. What you have is a gift. 
I know. I have it too. Mark is an empath, able to connect with the spirit world. And suddenly, a lot of strange experiences make some kind of sense. The more I talk with Karen, the more light she shed on past episodes in my, of my life. There were signs early on that I had a spiritual sense. I used to sleepwalk quite a bit. My parents were always terrified for me. But there's a price to be paid for having such a rare ability. If Mark remains determined to stay in his family home, he'll have to get used to the presence of spirits, including those intent on harming him. I explained to Mark that psychically open people need to learn how to control that which they know is around them, but perhaps isn't good for them. We needed to give him tools to be able to cope with what was happening around him through exercise, through prayer, through meditation. It sort of put everything into context, and I had a better understanding of what was going on and what my role was. Take care. Call me if you need to, OK? Many questions remain unanswered, but one thing is known. The spirits are still inside. As the days go by, Mark tries to follow their advice. He devotes more time to reinforcing his faith. Don't antagonize Mark. Don't engage. He concentrates on the physical aspects of his home. Mark senses he's not alone. I felt a very evil presence. Don't engage. A dark presence. Don't engage. I was upset. Don't antagonize. And I challenged it. Leave me alone! Leave me alone! Whatever was in the house John. had consumed a lot of my life. <laughs> Taking a lot of my time. added a lot of stress and negativity. I was fed up. That was it. It was war for me. The battle was on. Firehouse! Firehouse! No! 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 I felt a push. Mark Corvo was being terrorized by evil spirits in his 18th century Connecticut home. They're determined to kill him. Leave me alone! No! 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 Stay away from me! I felt the push. I was surprised I was alive. I should have been dead. Doctors told me that I had broken my back. After three weeks recovering in the hospital, Mark's sister Gina drives him home. Yeah, the battle rages on, as far as I'm concerned. Medium Karen Hollis realizes that letting his anger take control had been Mark's downfall. 
I think Mark came to understand that what he was doing was making the situation worse and that what he needed to do was to focus on the positive through prayer, through meditation, and through exercise so that he could go on and free himself from what had been happening in his own home. Sure you're gonna be okay? I'll be good. I'll be all right. This is something that he's always gonna have to deal with his entire life. Being an empath is not something you can entirely shut off. But he has the tools now to learn how to live with it. He knows not to be a victim of it. He knows how to push away the spirits, how to say, not today. I'm not gonna deal with this today. No matter where he goes or where he lives, he'll always be open to spiritual happenings. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. Over time, Mark has learned how to stop the spirits from ruining his life. Cling to what is good. Hate what is evil. I think faith is a big part of what helps protect me. They thrive on fear. Hate what is evil! Hate what is evil! Hate what is evil! What seems to keep them at bay is forgiveness and love. They cannot tolerate that. My experiences Who are you? with these spirits or entities gave me an appreciation for how powerful they can be and the damage that they can inflict. Ashley was engaged in her own attempt to control the spirits, which were uncontrollable. Loud. Go! She lost, they won, she left. And that's the sad truth of it. I was being targeted. These spirits wanted to harm me. Peace is returned to Mark's home, although he knows that at any time, the battles with the spirits may begin again. I made a very important decision that the house was important to me. It's my family's house, and I wanted to stay there. I know now I have the tools to protect myself, and along with my faith, I know that I can keep on fighting. Sandra Walter and her son, Jean, have always been close, sharing an interest in the occult. But when Sandra finds herself lost and alone, her fascination soon turns to obsession. As she heads down a dangerous path, Jean fears that his mother is turning against him. Between the world we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. The supernatural realm is vast and uncharted, attracting those who seek answers beyond the physical world. But its mysteries are infinite and its power unpredictable. When toyed with, its consequences can be deadly.
The year is 1965. Sandra Waldron and her son, Gene, have just settled into their new home in Geneva, Ohio. Her husband, Stephen, works at a nearby engineering company. Hey. How was your day? It was fine. How about you? Everything okay here? Oh, yeah. Stephen is the day. only father that Gene has ever known. Great. What's for dinner? I never really knew my real father. Stephen had been my stepfather since I was two, three years old. Hey, uh, do me a favor and take Gene inside and get him washed up for dinner. Honey, I've been working all day. I just want to get out of these clothes and relax. Hey, remember what I said before we got married? Parenting is a 24-hour job, and now you're a parent. My husband never mentioned that it bothered him that Jean wasn't his child, but I do think it did bother him some. I think he resented it a little bit. Come on, Jean, buddy. Let's go inside. Sandra hopes that one day Stephen will be able to accept Jean as his own. Sandra unearths an old cornerstone. Someone had died on our property, and it had been an old schoolmaster that had lived there quite a few years back. She's intrigued. She had no idea that her property was once the site of an old schoolhouse. Hey, what are you doing? Come on, let's eat. I'll be right there. And wonders how the schoolmaster passed away. Stephen, did you know there used to be a school here? What's that? There's a cornerstone out by the side of the house. Yeah, I remember our neighbor Denise say something about that. Sandra but has always believed in the existence of spirits and their interaction Denise? with the living world. But how'd she say he died? My interest in the occult and the supernatural has been with me all my life. There's so much that we don't know. It just fascinates me. I want to know all I can about it. Wow. Sandra, please don't start with that hocus pocus garbage again. You know, you've been spending way too much time reading those weird books again. The supernatural is kind of taboo for a lot of people. My husband was more apprehensive about those things than I was. Perhaps if you spent more time taking care of the house, that'd be a good idea. Stephen. I keep the house just fine. And I happen to think that my books are fascinating. Mm -hmm. Where are you going? What about dinner? Oh, I'm done with dinner. Honey, I'm just joking. Sandra's discovery of the cornerstone only fuels her interest in the occult. I believe if you're open to things, then maybe they can come in. Hey, it's getting late. Why don't you put that book down and get to sleep? And I bet you won't leave me alone until I do, right? You got it. Over the next month, Sandra soon forgets about the old schoolmaster.
and I heard these heavy boots and walked across the floor. Let's look upstairs, okay? She assumes that it's Stephen, home early from work. Stephen? There's definitely no one there. It maybe alarmed me a little bit, but I wasn't really scared. It just really piqued my curiosity. Because of her interest in the occult, Sandra wonders if she could have invited a presence into her home. I decided that, well, maybe it was the schoolmaster that was haunting our house. I wasn't doing anything intentionally, but I could have possibly opened a door. A few years pass. And Jean is now 11 years old. I'm sorry. That's okay. Boys are allowed to be boys. Terrified of my dad. Yeah, if they were at my house playing and they saw my dad pull up, they ran. Everybody was scared of him. You see this? This is gonna cost money. I'm sorry. I'll work it off, I promise. That goes without saying. You'll work every weekend cutting the grass until you pay for this. Gene's relationship with his stepfather never really develops. He was always angry and yelling at me. He never told me he loved me. He never said anything nice to me. And that was never good enough for him. Steven, give Gene a break. It was an accident. He was just trying to have some fun with his friends. We could all use a little more fun around here. Sandra, this is going to cost me an arm and a leg to fix. Your son has no concept of money. Steven's ambivalence towards Gene begins to put a strain on their marriage. I'm sorry. I meant our son been a long day. Why don't you go inside and I'll be in the wild fix dinner. My husband was very critical of Jean. It was painful for me. I love my son and I, I wanted him to feel more comfortable at home. I tell you what, there's a scary movie on tonight. How about we watch it? Okay. <laughs> okay. As Stephen grows distant, it only brings Sandra and Jean closer together. My favorite thing to do was to watch scary movies. When we watch movies together, uh, we turn the lights down, you know, get some popcorn, and just make an evening of it. It was just a lot of fun um, being scared. Somewhere else, and let us watch the movie. 
Don't worry, I won't ruin your night. Besides, I'm gonna go watch the game with the guys. So, how are things with you and Stephen lately? The next day, Sandra and Jean go over to their neighbor Denise's house. Hey, Jean. Can you go home and get that can of beans out of the cupboard? Okay, Mom. Okay, and hurry up, because we're going to eat soon. I never experienced anything like that before. I just felt that, that there was something evil in the house. Sandra believes that Jean was visited by the schoolmaster, but she downplays the incident, not wanting to feed into his fear. She just completely wrote it off, and I began to wonder later if maybe it was my imagination. Still, Sandra is intrigued by Jean's encounter. She hopes to one day become a published author and begins to write about his experience. After a few weeks, Gene soon forgets about his unexplainable encounter. Instead, Gene has been eagerly awaiting for the boat trip that Stephen has planned for this day. What are you doing in that boat? I was just checking it out. Well, it's not yours to check out, is it? I wasn't going to break anything. I was just sitting in it. Well, then get out of it. You got no business being in there in the first place. Whenever I was around my stepfather, you were walking on eggshells. And you knew if you just said the wrong thing, he was going to explode. And you have no respect. I go out of my way to get this boat so I can make your mom happy and take you fishing. And what do I get? Maybe I shouldn't go then. What? Of course you're going. You've been looking forward to it all week. He's just gonna yell at me. I don't wanna go. Please don't make me go. Okay, maybe I'll stay home too. No way, Sandra. What are my friends gonna say if you're not there? Under no circumstances are we going to cancel this boat trip. Just go ahead, Mom. I am not leaving you home alone. Sandra, quit babying the kid. He's old enough to stay home alone. I am not babying him. I'm his mother, and I worry about him. I'll just go to Mark and Jimmy's house until you get back. Are you sure? Well, then, we'll be back at 7. Okay. All right, be a good boy. We'll see you later this evening. Gene returns from his friend's house and sees that his parents are still out for the night. Steven, is that you? 
Tell me what happened. Tell me what's going on. Gene, it's okay. It's okay. We're home now. For crying out loud. You were right. We can't leave the kid home alone. Stephen, do me a favor and just get out of here so I can see what's going on. It's okay, Gene. Gene tries to explain to his mother what he saw. I saw a tall, thin man, and his face was all red and, and disfigured, and it just terrified me. Why am I seeing these awful things? There's something I should have told you a long time ago, but I didn't. I've got something to show you. I think the person you saw was a man who had lived here a long time ago. Sandra tells him about the schoolmaster who died on their property. He knew something was going on. I felt really bad for Gene. I did, and uh, I didn't want to see him that frightened. This man, he died right here? In our front yard? I think so. At least she goes on to say that she has had many encounters with his spirit and has never felt Maybe threatened by his presence. Sandra figures that Gene is just overreacting because of his age. Think of it like one of those scary movies that we like to watch. They're really scary, but in the end, it's just a movie. Gene eventually accepts his mother's explanation. She made me feel so much better and not be so afraid because I knew that my mother was there for me and wouldn't let anything happen to me. Sandra is able to comfort Jean. She wonders if there is a way to remove the spirit from the house. before I went up to bed. I'll be up in a minute. Well, don't take too long. see or hear from the schoolmaster again. But another problem is plaguing the house. Sandra and Stephen begin to fight non-stop. And Gene does whatever he can to escape. Gene, it's good to see you again. I guess your parents couldn't make it here today. You know how stuff My best friend invited me to church early on, and I really liked it, and I just kept on going pretty much ever since. And if you need someone to talk to, give me a call. Okay, thanks. Church was a reason to stay away from the house.
For weeks, Sandra has the same dream over and over again. The dreams were usually much more vivid to me than regular dreams. And she wonders what these recurring images could possibly mean. doing we're fighting all of the time and it just doesn't seem to be getting any better we cannot go on like this you're right Sandra we have grown apart I've been denying it for so long I can't do it anymore Stephen it's over. Here, I'll get that for you. It just finally got to the point where I had to leave. Well, I guess this is it. Take good care of your mother, okay? Although the breakup is hard, Sandra knows that it's for the best. I felt it was a good thing. I was looking to start a new life, but I had no idea what lay ahead. I was hoping it was the right thing to do. Sandra decides to move back to Texas City, her hometown. Texas City was where I was born and raised. I had family there. I hoped that would be good for me and my son both. Sandra hasn't left Geneva in years, but suddenly, the drive becomes oddly familiar. The dream was definitely an indication that I was going to be leaving. She now realizes that her dreams are visions of the future. I thought it was so obviously prophetic. Sandra finds a small house that she can afford. What is this filthy thing doing in here? Right in the center of that floor was a star, a five-pointed star. What is it, Mom? It's a symbol. It's called a pentagram. Sandra is familiar with the pentagram, having read about it in her books on the occult. What's it mean? It means different things to different people. She also knows that people have used it to practice witchcraft. When I first discovered the pentagram, I thought, wow, there were witches here. I knew that it would just depend, you know, which way you use the star, whether it was good or bad. Uh, I'm gonna check out I wondered, was this coincidence? Or had I, by some unnatural forces, come to this house? I saw it as a positive sign that maybe, maybe I was on the right path. Over the next few years, Sandra struggles with the pressures of being a single mother and has little time to focus on anything else. She takes on odd jobs to support her and Jean but finds herself struggling to pay the mounting bills. Since my husband and I had split, I had never really worked. I had to support myself and my son, and uh, I was scared. Sandra hopes to sell one of her stories to a publisher, 
but her dream of becoming an author is no closer to coming true. Come on. Hey. Jean is now ready to graduate high school. Hey, there's a zombie movie on tonight. You want to watch it? You know, I'm not into that stuff anymore. Besides, I told you I already made plans with friends. Can I put on the car? Jean and I were getting more distant. And that made me sad because I wanted us to be close. Just don't drive too fast, OK? See you later. With Jean no longer around, Sandra finds solace in her books on the occult, which have always given her comfort. She is immediately drawn to Wicca, an earth-based religion that worships both a male and female deity. It was positive on the female side. Women were equal with men. I think that's one of the things that attracted me. She is also intrigued by the Wiccan belief that one can create change using the energy that surrounds them. Sandra creates an altar using items that represent the four elements of nature, earth, air, fire, and water. I didn't have anybody to teach me, so I had to learn everything on my own, through books, primarily. I was hoping with Wicca that maybe I could change things. Maybe I could make things more positive in my life, in my son's life. Sandra performs her first ritual. Earth sanctions my magic tonight. She calls out to the god and goddess, asking them to help ease her growing debt. I call forth the forces of prosperity, truth, transformation, and purification. Sandra repeats the chant over and over again, channeling the energy around her. Mother goddess, father god, grant me this wish. You can actually feel like an energy. It's a sensation of like an electrical power going through your body. It's a very positive feeling of power. Weeks later, Sandra receives a letter from a magazine. They plan to publish one of her short stories and have included a generous paycheck. When my first ritual worked, I was hooked. It made me feel like I had some kind of control over my life, that I can make things change when they go wrong. My mother just got deeper and deeper into the supernatural, and it just drove me more awake. I'd been scared to death when I was a kid, and I was afraid that something was going to happen. Morning, Ma. Oh, gee, I had the most incredible dream last night. Actually, I think it was a vision. I really My mom just started talking to me about the occult a whole lot more. 
I really think that this experience is a sign of things to come. It just seems like we were becoming two different people and going our own ways. But enough about that. So, graduation is less than a month away. Have you started looking for a job? Sort of. Really? <laughs> well, tell me, what are you going to be doing? I signed up with the Air Force. I'm leaving just a couple days after graduation. Can't believe it. Well, wow. I'm proud of you, Jean. Thanks, Mom. The relationship between my mother and I had gotten so strained that I decided my best chance was to join the military, get away, clear my head, figure out the answers to life's questions myself without my mother's influence. Soon after Gene graduates, he leaves to serve in the Air Force. When Jean was in the military, I really got into Wicca and started really practicing it and uh, doing rituals. Over the years, Jean slowly loses touch with his mother. After I joined the Air Force and I started to travel, I couldn't tell anybody what I was doing. I could hardly ever see my mom. After seven years in the Air Force, Gene returns home to Texas City. I was looking forward to seeing my mother and, and coming home. And I thought things were going to be great. Gene. He is surprised by Sandra's appearance and is unsure how to react to this unexpected change. She had black hair, black blouse, black pants. She had a necklace with a pentagram on it. I was just dazed. I'm so glad you're finally home. Looks like you remodeled while I was away. Well, let's get you set up in your old room. It's just as you left it. I, uh, remember this being here. Well, I'll... I'll leave you to unpack, and dinner will be in half an hour. It was just too much for me. The way my mom looked, the way the house was. Now I have a picture of the devil in my room. By the last couple years in the military, I started to really go to church. And so by the time I got out, I was a very devout Christian. That evening, mm. Sandra and Jean <laughs> catch up over dinner. That looks and smells as good as I remember it. Well, I know it's your favorite. So, tell me, what's been happening? Hmm. Well, life has been great, Jean. I mean, ever since I started practicing Wicca, things have changed, and for the better. What does that mean, exactly, to study Wicca? So I was concerned that she was Wicca practicing some form of magic. Religion. Even if her so, intentions were good, it, the potential for it to go wrong just is what scared me. Honey, there's nothing to be concerned about. Thank you for your blessing. My 
my gratitude is endless. Continue to protect us, especially Jean, now that he's in your watchful eye. As I receive your energy, now you receive mine. Continue to protect us, especially Jean. As I receive your energy, now you receive mine. My gratitude is endless. As I receive your energy, now you receive mine. Thank you, great goddess. Later that night. I thought, what, what, what was it? And I thought maybe it was just headlights shining in the window. I've been worried sick about you. Worried sick? Really? Did you get up in the middle of the night to check on me? Because last night I was attacked. I was attacked by a woman that looked just like you. I have no idea what you're talking about. Mom. It wasn't me, I, I promise you that. Mother, I'm scared for you. I'm scared of what you've let in. You're opening doors you don't know how to close. Gene, I'm not doing anything wrong. Mom, you're in over your head. You've got to stop this right now. I don't know what to tell you other than I love you and I would never do anything to hurt you. You know this, right? I don't know anything anymore. I gotta go, I need to clear my head. Gene scours the library, hoping to find something that could explain what he experienced. I had never seen lights like these before. I wanted to know what it was. He discovers a book on the occult that refers to these paranormal phenomena as sprites. These sprites, they were a product of witchcraft. I believe that her tensions were good, but that she had let something in the house that was evil. I didn't want to go back, but I realized my mom was in trouble. I had to have the courage to go back in the house and fight for my mom because I knew someone was trying to destroy us both. Mom? 
You home? We need to talk. When I saw my cross in a pentagram, I was furious. I cannot believe you, mother. You are messing with things that you cannot control. Where are you going? I'm afraid of what you've let in. And I'm not gonna stick around and see what happens. I thought my mom was casting spells on me. Jean now believes that the schoolmaster was really an evil entity that his mother may have conjured up many years ago. Something came into my mother's life when I was a child and tried to show her dreams and tried to take her down a path into the occult. He cuts all ties with Sandra realizing that there is nothing he can do to stop her. I felt that my mom was too far gone. The more I talked to her, the more I thought that she was lying to herself, lying to me. So I finally left. Sandra is devastated by Jean's angry departure. I was really upset that he thought I was causing something. I could understand maybe why he would think I was doing it because I said I was a witch. But she continues to practice Wicca despite her son's warning. I was gonna do a dedication to Isis. Isis is the supreme mother goddess of ancient Egypt. She is also considered the most powerful deity of the Pantheon. Great goddess Isis, I dedicate myself to you. In this place of power, I open myself to your energy. Great goddess Isis, make me one with your spirit. I dedicate myself to you. Sandra prays to Isis, believing that she can guide her through this turbulent time. In this place of power, I open myself to your energy. I open myself to your energy. Great goddess Isis, make me one with your spirit. I dedicate myself to you. Goddess Isis, I dedicate myself to you. Goddess Isis, I dedicate myself to you. Close the door to the other side.
I think they were demons. This scared me so bad that I said, that's it. I want out. I don't know what I'm doing. It was definitely something I couldn't control. You're messing with something that is beyond our comprehension. Jean and Sandra eventually reconcile their relationship, and they are closer than ever before. Now we talk almost every day, and we're trying to make up for lost time. So, and everything else is going well? Yes, it is. Jean is now a minister and counsels people who are victims of supernatural events. Sandra finally realizes her dream and becomes a published author. <laughs> she never practices Wicca again. She believes that her inexperience with practicing magic allowed these demonic entities into their lives. It's possible that my interest in the occult all my life could have opened some doors. I could have been manipulated by demons or other spirits. I just don't know. I don't know the answers. I believe that it started out as one evil spirit that just became many and tried to destroy our lives. Thank you.